nutrition, lifestyle, and PED education. This is the Elite Strength Podcast with Aaron Scoffey. Welcome back, guys and girls, to another episode of the Elite Strength Podcast, the first one for this year, here with my friend and guest from the US, Luke of No Switch Fitness. How are you, buddy? Good, man. Excited for today's podcast. I think uh, a lot, lot of productive conversations to be had here. So we look yeah, well, into. like we're saying off camera, uh, hopefully it gets more productive than it's already started. I've already broken a coffee cup, so that's great. And my finger's bleeding all over the shop. <laughs> it's all right. And you're getting phone calls, but it's all happening today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. That's no, right. So what's, what's the time there now? 3.30, 4.30, 3.30. 2.30, 2.30. Oh, 2.30, sorry, 2.30 p.m. <laughs> How's the day been so far? Get into the gym, train at all? Uh, today's a rest day. Mondays are, are my my day to get the week started off correct and get ahead on some check-in and some new client plans and for the week and, and kind of make sure that we're rocking and rolling as far as my clients go. Yes, you don't subscribe to the you have to train on a Monday? No, I don't. <laughs> no, I, me either. Me either. Monday's like my rest day as well. <laughs> I like having Sunday as my leg day. Yeah. And just from like a, a schedule planning perspective, like my upper needs so much more than my lower. I don't want the leg day to precede any of my upper training sessions. Right. So yeah. it's yeah. like, I, I have to make sure that that's there. And just from like a time perspective too, Sunday is the one day that I don't like overly work unless I have to. Yeah. And yeah. legs always turns into like a two and a half hour session with my crew. So yeah. Um, so it's the yeah. easiest day to just sort of do it your own pace. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah no, that's completely fair. Um, I'm a similar mindset. I actually take Mondays off in terms of training and I get all my back paperwork done. So I do all my clients work and my back end work. That's a big, big laptop day, <laughs> computer day. Um, I guess, how is your training going at the moment? Training for anything specific? Have comps coming up or are you sort of just going through a growth phase? What's happening? Growth phase for me. Um, so we just wrapped up a uh, super physiological push. So I'm back on baseline for a bit. Um, going through the process of trying to have a kid for the next three to four months. Oh, fair enough. Good see luck. how that goes mm -hmm. um, throughout the HRT phase. And then uh, depending on whether we get pregnant or not, will be a growth phase from there um, mm -hmm. because we'll probably go the route of like freezing sperm or anything yep. along those lines if we don't. Yep. Um, but yeah, just kind of in a health phase, productive training, we're still going along. I'm I'm one of I'm a big proponent of still like making sure that training meets the needs just from a recovery standpoint and making mm -hmm. sure that it's still progressive in nature. Yep. Um, I think there's definitely progress to be had within the baseline HRT environment. For sure. Um, so just making sure health checks out over the next three to, to four months. Yep. Um, got an echo scheduled and a couple other things, making sure my blood pressure management gets back in a check. Um, Cause it kind of got a little wonky there when I started getting up by two fifty three, two fifty four, 254 yep. um, and then just kind of let it ride and then be ready to rock as long as everything is kind of checked out. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say, what did you end up, if you don't mind me asking, what did you end up climbing up to in terms of PEDs in terms of sort of, I guess, milligram per kilo, if you want to go that way, or if you want to go. Yeah. So dose use. escalation uh, made it all the way to 200 milligrams of master on every other day mm -hmm. and test stayed at 60 migs every other day. So yep. if you want to call that about 800 migs total. Yep. Um, I was post-show, mm -hmm. post-prep. So I was taking a lot of progress on the nutrition front and the yep. training front. So yep. total milligrams didn't need to get as high. Uh, growth hormone was in play at five and a yep. half IUs as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just kind of kept with test and master on for me, like yeah, perfect. as I get in the all season, obviously higher body compositions, higher aromatization rates. So my test actually kind of pulls back quite yes. a bit. Yep. Um, Fair. And, and master on dose kind of like levies up with mm -hmm. that. Um, and so we took like three progressions across that phase as far as dose progression. Yep. I don't yep. take quite as minor progressions as frequently. I take more substantial progression. Progressions over. Yeah, a little period. bit more spread out. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it was a little above 800 milligrams total, but granted, it's probably not what I would consider a peak dose for yeah, me. That, that'd be nothing for you, I imagine. Like considering due, what your due body to weight the is. Post contest phase, yeah. right? So, um, yeah. So I didn't really get too too high, but my body also kind of started fighting me there for a bit. Like that's fair. I started the post contest phase at like 214, mm -hmm. 215. 
and two fifty three. Yeah, 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 right. It really took oh. advantage took advantage of that super compensation phase that you could uh, <laughs> have post diet or post prep. Yeah, so that that kind of looked like eight weeks of HRT just yep. to kind of get me feeling good again, drop fatigue, all of that, kind of get the training block set up. Mm-hmm. Um, then the super physiological push was for sixteen to seventeen weeks. I'll have to look back at the calendar. Yeah. Um, and now we're here. So yeah. it was really productive, man. This is the biggest and leanest I've ever been. Uh, for me, I stopped prep about four weeks out because mm-hmm. my wife was going to give another crack at a pro card okay. um, the week I was supposed to compete. So that was not uh, going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so I actually pulled out probably four weeks out, four and a half. I probably had another five pounds to clip off to be anatomy charted. So <laughs> yeah. You're looking at like 209, 210, yep. which for heavies is like 224 and a quarter is the top of that cap. So yeah. um, for me, man, like it's just a year of coaching. I'm going to be traveling a lot. I've got the seminars in the UK. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be like a max out at the top of the heavyweights type yeah, of year. Yeah, for sure. That, that, that's completely fair, man. I mean, I did. So I remember seeing your photos come in. You look like really peeled. And then, um, like you said, you were coaching, you're coaching your wife, yeah? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So you're prepping her for her show. How did she end up going after all that? She, so she missed her pro card by a spot at the first national show. Yep. Um, And then she got about two weeks in the dieting for that second one. Yep. And she'd been, no, she'd been prepping for 36 weeks already. So yeah, that's, was, that's hard. Yeah. She yeah. was so done. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fair. Like, <laughs> so there's only so much you can tolerate before it's just like, nah, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah, that was that was still back during COVID shit. So she had dieted for eight weeks and then took a like two or three week break and then we were back at it. Yeah. So it ended up being like 36 weeks. It was she was just it was yeah, so over it. Yeah, that, that, like. yeah, that's yeah, hundred percent. You couldn't blame anyone for that. That's brutal. Um talking about I guess yeah, yourself and your business and the business name, no switch, I guess, where did that come from? <laughs> it's an it's an interesting uh, business name. Yeah, so it's kind of a a representation of my personality a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm a very type A, like I don't do things on the side very well type of person. So Mm -hmm. people have always kind of referred to it as like being a light switch. So like you're on about it, you're all the way on or you're all the way off and you don't give a fuck about it. Um, And so like no off switch is like having no off switch in the pursuit of results for everyone that I work with, including my own process and it's more just a mentality, right? Like there's core pillars of our brand that we kind of represent, which is going to be like that education side and Mm -hmm. the mentality side of having no off switch in the pursuit of results is like our primary two. Mm -hmm. And that's where the brand kind of flourishes, right? No switch fitness is having that no off switch in the pursuit of results. Um, And just from like pursuing bodybuilding being that 99% of the people that I coach are competitive bodybuilders. Yes. It's the kind of mindset that if you're going to compete at the highest level has to be there, yep. um, especially with the level of things that you have to sacrifice in order to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as just like your day to day life and everything. Um, I'm, I'm a really big fan of like having that mentality because then it's not a question of if it's just when yes. for most people and yeah. um, making it happen if they're able to withstand the test of time. Yep. And I guess uh, for, from a competitive standpoint, do you ever having inquiries i imagine you do but um where those that come to you are like look i want to be a pro and you just you, you sort of look at them and you're like look you know i'm, I'm glad you have every attribute needed by the genetics <laughs> like you just it, like we can do the best that we can with what we got but <laughs> like it is a genetically yeah. elite game <laughs> yeah it is, it is a very very genetically predominated sport mm-hmm. right um mm-hmm. I think there's obviously a spectrum of that, right? Like you can have people that maybe not have the best genetics, but can still make it happen with time and work. Hundred percent, yeah. Um, they just may be the people turning pro at 32, 33, 34. Um, but obviously, like from a genetic standpoint, unfortunately, what I see a lot of times is that it's not always a genetics problem. It's more like how much they actually give themselves to it, or how they were doing things in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, as like the more frequent actual conversation, it's like you see like the progress and you see how long they've been actually bodybuilding. And then you kind of get an overview of what they've been doing. And it's like, man, there's so many holes here. Like no wonder you're not a representation of X amount of years at work. 
Um, but yeah, when you have the, the, the genetically disadvantaged, the conversations always should be about why you're doing it. Right. So yes. if the why is strictly about turning pro first off, I would highly suggest that you kind of check why you're doing the sport in the first place. Yep. Um, cause a pro status is not going to change your life, uh, yeah. completely. Right. It's not going to make it do yeah. a one eight. Well, yeah. Um, I think it's more about the process and the journey and what you can garner from that and what you can put that into as far mm-hmm. as like not only bodybuilding, but other things outside of life. Like for me, man, like just as an example, like I am not genetically the most gifted individual. <laughs> I've been bodybuilding for fuck like 11 years now, 10, 11 years. Yep. Um, and I know that and coaching is where my passion and my legacy will, will, will lie. Mm-hmm. Um, coaching and educating and, and, and raising the standard at which we hold coaches on in the online bodybuilding industry Yes, um, is exactly where my legacy would be. And that's kind of where I start to encourage people is like, like find your own thing, man. Like it doesn't have to be coaching. It can be clothing. It can yeah. be some sort of supplement brand. Like it can be whatever it is that you want to make it. Um, but it doesn't always mean that competing is off the table, right? Because yes. I'm still competing. I just want to see how far I can go. I have my own personal goals and aspirations when it comes to my competing. But at the end of the day, my clients come before all of, of that, right? Yeah, so for sure. That's kind of like where I am at. And it's kind of like a coach first mentality. I have a couple of good friends who are also in this industry that kind of get that as well. So yep. um it's a, it's a very rewarding way to be because for a sport that can be so selfish, you can also invest so much in other people. Yeah. It can take away a lot of your time, right? Yeah. And it can, it can be just as rewarding, if not more rewarding than your own personal competing. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was actually listening. Who was it that said that recently on a podcast that they, oh, it was not recently. It was actually an older podcast. Matt Jansen had said something very similar his own aspirations. And then he actually was, he felt more complete having his clients win shows versus himself trying to win his pro card. So definitely a sentiment. I think a lot of coaches share, <laughs> um, yeah, not just in sure. bodybuilding, it's like powerlifting or basically any, any sort of, uh, coaching uh, when their clients achieve a result or the result that they were going for, it's just much more fulfilling as a coach. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of like, a lot of the conversation around the education stuff that we do as far as the seminars, the stuff we do through J3 university is around elevating the standard at which we hold coaches. Right. Um, But I don't think that you can do that unless you represent that yourself. Yes. And that's kind of a big why as to like why I want to see everybody in my roster get invested in 100% in the way that, that I, I I am right. I can that's that's kind of where we, we start to, change that tone and change that conversation of like online coaching is a bad thing Mm -hmm. into online coaching can be something that can change lives and be something that's um really really a positive in the bodybuilding industry right like this industry has given me so much um it was in not maybe the greatest state as far as coaches were when i first came into it but (laughs) yeah (laughs) the trajectory is moving in the right direction right and there's a lot of people that are spreading Um, really good information as far as bettering coaching practices. And, um, we're all kind of in the same click slash group and know each other and have the same friends and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it's, it's a good direction to see the industry moving towards. It's not that we'll ever get rid of all the bad, but it's just on average seeing kind of the trajectory move in the right direction. Yeah. And I guess I'm leading into something you mentioned J3 university and having that resource to help better the coaching industry, I guess, online. Um, I, I guess talk a bit about uh, J3 University and sort of your role there, because I know you have your hypertrophy course as well um, as a part of, uni- of the university, but I know it's mostly, or it was mostly John that had uh, created the original content for sort yeah, of the course, so, I guess we'd say, the short course. Yeah, so for those of you guys who don't know, John Jewett is a 212 IFBB pro. Um, he's been my mentor for the last six years, seven years. Um, And it's basically a university type platform of like self-talk course information where we kind of dive into educational material to help you coach yourself and, or if you're coaching other clientele. Um, And I am the, the, the main educator outside of John. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's just me and John right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I have my own course, the applied hypertrophy optimization module on there that walks you through optimizing setups for training for every single body part, 
Um, all of this educational material is self-paced. So you're always going to be moving through the course and all the information at your own pace. Um, and it's really kind of a platform for us to help coaches level up. Um, and the big thing there with that is going to be uh, some of the other things that come along with it. So like I teach a live stream education, kind of like a lecture every other weekend, mm -hmm. there's open forums for us to answer questions for, and it's just meant to be a place for coaches to better themselves. Um, competitors too. So there's plenty of competitors that are on there. Um, but it's just an opportunity for us to raise the level of education across the across the board um if you guys just check out the links in my bio i have all the links to all of that kind of in there we'll throw um, the links up on the podcast as well but um, yeah and yes. so so that's like the main online platform and then the seminars are kind of like the in-person events that we do um that are, are really really exciting exciting weekends and really are give us an opportunity to, to cover the stuff that you can't do online yeah. Any so, plans to do any seminars in Australia by any chance? <laughs> actually, yes. So I have a friend of mine who's building his gym facility that should be done by the end of the month. Yeah. Um, and it looks like as long as those borders open up to the end <laughs> yeah. of the year yeah. would be kind of where we land. So November, December, hopefully coming to Australia. So we go to the UK in March. We're going to yeah. do one or two here in the United States and then hopefully mm -hmm. wrap up the year in Australia as long as you can get your borders open um, so yeah. that's <laughs> on the calendar, but on a TBD basis. That's completely and utterly fair enough, my friend. Um, when it comes to coaching, so you said you deal with mostly competitors. Um, do yep. you have any lifestyle type clients, I guess would be, or I, I'd use the term gen pop, but I think it's more popular to use lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So lifestyle clients, I have a couple um, more. So they're, their lifestyle, the lifestyle clients that I coach are just very serious about, their process so they may not be competitive bodybuilders but they're almost treating it as if they were yeah um i also have two coaches under me so mm -hmm. like no switch fitness is a like a coaching community um obviously me as the owner um but i have two coaches olivia gravengard and alan murphy who both take on lifestyle clients so yes most of the lifestyle clients within our business are coached by them nowadays yep, yep. um so it's a, it's a really good opportunity to get plugged into the business and all everything that we do um as far as like the lifestyle stuff goes, cause we do do it and we do love it. Um, it's just right now with, with where I'm at, like I have a lot of competitors competing at a very high level Yes, and I really need to be able to invest fully into them. So I've actually turned off accepting lifestyle clients for a bit, yep. um, but I send them straight to Olivia and Allen. So uh, we're always down to help. I think it's just more the willingness to help is the main thing we're wanting to see right or the willingness to learn and, and if you're if you have that like we can get you from where you are to where you want to be for sure um and looking at i guess some of your clients so we've already had one of them on here being kuba um yeah i guess how did that sort of come about because i know he's a very popular man in england <laughs> when it comes yeah to, uh, so he's kuba, famous as fuck <laughs> kuba and i go back a bit a little yeah. bit um he during his last off season would kind of shoot me some of his movements and i'd give him some feedback and a couple things um, and he was wrapping up his prep and he kind of reached out to me and he said, he just wanted me to bring me in the loop, mm -hmm. basically have me managing the training completely and solely. Um, and then as far as like the nutrition and the drug side, we'd kind of like converse back and forth yeah. a bit. And, yeah. um, he's, he's more doing that mostly himself, but yeah. we go over it every week with check-ins about what we think the smart decision is here is mm -hmm. I give my opinion. And to be honest, like he's so receptive to it. He ends up pretty much just taking my information and using it most of the time anyways. Yep. Uh, yep. But he, he is making the final decisions there. Uh, but it's, it's just a good, it's a good working experience, right? I'm a really big advocate of communication and attention to detail being the cornerstones at which coaching a client, it kind of hinges on as far as mm -hmm. the coach client relationship and Cuba is at the top of his game when it comes to both of those. Yep. And so when you just click on the same wavelength and it, it just works really well, like the dude is a fucking workhorse yeah. and <laughs> it just makes my job so easy because I know everything that's going on um, no matter what. And he just makes honestly, he makes yeah. me look good sometimes just because like <laughs> he's put in the work. It's like one of the best quotes I've ever heard is like, it's so easy to coach someone when they follow the plan. And it's like, because you can actually coach in that situation, yep. you can actually react to what's happening. Yes. Um, where some of coaching or a lot of coaching, in my opinion, is psychological management and like yes. actual client management. Yes. Um, 
which is where the communication, attention to detail comments mm -hmm. kind of come from, from my situations. Mm -hmm. um, because X's, O's, those kinds of things, if someone's executing a plan, there's no doubt in my mind I can get them where they need to go. 100%. Uh, yeah, and so Cuba is a, a great example of that. I've got a got a bunch of pros competing this year, um, so I'm super excited. That's some WPD yeah. bros, some figure pros. Cool. Um, and then most of my bigger guys are waiting for 23. But yep. yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun year, man. A lot of travel on the schedule for sure, too. Yep. And it, are you concerned? I guess you wouldn't be, but are you concerned at all with the potential uh, travel um, getting in the way of you know communication with clients and that sort of stuff? Being different time zones, for example, and you know just simply being in the air, potentially not being able to be on your like a laptop or a phone to communicate. Yeah. So it's. It's pretty manageable yep. um, because most of my clients are really self-sufficient individuals. Yes. Um, and so like, as long as they're following the check-in systems and process that I have in place, which has like a tracker set up and a bunch yep. of things for them, as far as like tools that they can use, mm -hmm. uh, it makes my job super easy to be able to go through every little detail of what they're doing mm -hmm. um, and really shoot responses back to them fairly quickly. Right. Yep. Um, the only thing that happens sometimes is, uh, most airplanes will have internet, so I yep. can use that, but I just can't send the sponsors responses via the video response that I yep. would like to do. Yes. So typically it's like a screencast or a loom for those yep. of you that are. Yep. We, uh, we use loom down here. Most of us anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing. Um, but just when I travel, man, it just turns into voice notes or emails and yep. that's the only difference. It's still the same level of detail, but no, the travel part, because of my clients being so good at what they do, which mm -hmm. is a huge part of coaching, right, is like educating your clients to the point that they're very good at what they do as well. Yes. Um, it makes my job easy when even when I travel yep. um, because they're still doing what they need to be doing and I can still get them to the best that they need to be. So, no, man, communication for me is probably the easiest part of this. It's just I think the hardest part sometimes is bringing people up to that level. Um, because there's a standard that should be held and I'm a really big advocate of making sure that standard is upheld mm -hmm. um, and maybe not lowering those standards to the individual, but bringing that person up to the standards. Right. And yep. so that's typically the only thing that has to happen just sometimes with people. Yep. That's completely fair. Um, when it comes to your sort of coaching and the way that you do coach and mostly with your, your athletes, I guess your bodybuilders, there's always so much <laughs> debate, I will say, in the industry when it comes to mostly volume. I, well, I mean, there are many other debates, but when it comes to the volume debate, sort of that higher intensity, lower volume type training where it's, you know, one to two sets, um, maybe maximum of three sets, or we look at the lower intensity, but the higher volume type training, um, whether that be spread across, you know, more days across a week or whether that just be more sets in a workout. Uh, do you particularly, you know, subscribe to either or, or is it sort of managed based on the client? Very managed based off the client. I actually have a couple of people who would probably lean more towards the volume side of the spectrum. And it's just <laughs> the way you manage the program is a little different, but I will say just because of the content I put out, I typically draw the crowd. That's a little bit more psychologically driven towards like failure training. Yes. Um, and I, I'm a big proponent of thinking this is like a spectrum, right? So like of course. the far the far left hand end of the spectrum is like the lowest volumes you can train with to elicit hypertrophy, mm -hmm. but the highest levels of intensity, um, intensity being load and proximity to failure. Yep. Yep. Um, and then on the right hand side being obviously the higher volume crowd, um, but the intensity side is, is typically a pretty low. Mm -hmm. so it'll accumulate over time or something along those lines, depending on whoever model you're talking about. Um, but if you look at that spectrum, I'd probably say I'm like left of center when it's like closer to the lower volume, higher intensity group. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also not a do things just because they're a major compound and it's cool to see six plates on a bar <laughs> doing it. Right. So yep. there, there needs to be background information on the client that allows you to kind of place them on that spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. There's even data. If we look at some of the research studies, I believe it's coming out of D'Souza's lab out of the University of Tampa. Mm -hmm. um, it shows that like previous level of volume or previous volume training levels uh, kind of coming into a situation or a new training block can influence the response to the volume yeah. training level that they're at. Mm -hmm. So 
a lot of the information as far as like what I'm gathering upon intake is kind of built around that. And then where I place them on the spectrum is kind of based on how they come in off of that. And so it, it is very individual. I will say if you look, want to talk about it, a spectrum, um, I'm probably close to midline spectrum over to the left a little bit as far yes. as like moderate volumes, but still training to failure. Um, intensities from like a percent load on the bar. We're probably never dipping below six reps, yeah. um, six to seven. Um, so we're not doing the threes and the fours, the load testers, those kinds of things, just because I think we can probably be a little bit more specific to hypertrophy than doing some of the load test sets. That's fair. Um, and that's kind of like where I, where I lie and it just kind of flexes based on the client. But I will say that I do lean towards that side definitely a lot more. Do you find a, a difference or more of a difference, I guess, between male and female clients? Or is it more so just the psychological type of uh, the, the mentality of the client, I guess we'll say? Yeah. So mentality is a large, large proponent of it, right? Like myself and my two training partners, like I know that they can go in there and take it to the brink of hell, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm not so confident about that with some of my online clients, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you can use training videos to kind of, of course, yeah, you know, hundred percent gather some information on that. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at male versus female, there's obviously data that shows like recovery capacities with females on more frequent yes. basis happens. Yes. Um, I actually participated in a study or actually helped facilitate a study at USF that we had that was comparing male versus female quad extensions, mm -hmm. um, and just recovery capacity from that. Um, typically what I see is that females can get away with a little bit higher volumes and a little bit higher frequencies. Now yes. there's a couple situations that kind of lend to that, right. Um, as far as like a female's ability to have recovery capacity, mm -hmm. the relative lows at which they're training at. So you get a female that's very strong on the female spectrum, then that, that starts to not kind of hold quite as true. Yes. Um, but typically I can see them getting away with more volumes and more higher frequency. That being said, um, contextually to the season of the year. Yes, um, of course. So across a contest prep, mm -hmm. I will see females do adapt a little bit harder to prepping. Mm -hmm. So the difference in volume levels from start to end of prep look a lot different than for, yes. for male clients typically yeah. um partially a hormonal environment perspective right like we have a lot more tools in the in the box mm -hmm. for a male client relative yes. to a female client Definitely. um but that's probably like contextually the information you would like to see right like off season female can probably handle a little more yep um and then males in the contest prep towards the end are typically getting away with just a smidge more yep um i guess between off season and I guess, comp prep, do you alternate between the amount of days that you prefer to have clients train? So would it be, you know, maybe a five day, six day training split over the off season versus a four or five day comp prep or other way around, or it's just, again, based on the client and volume landmarks. I'm a really big proponent of, of consistency throughout. So what does their schedule lend them to the, be able to devote the most energy to, mm -hmm um, and recover from, um, let's set those baselines in the off season. Um, and then let's use that baseline to kind of guide where, um, we train during prep as in like, if you're running a two on one off in the off season and recovering, well, that's probably the framework in which you should probably operate off of yeah. with within contest prep. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the only time that I've seen it change most of the time, and I will say this, is fitting in cardiovascular activity across a week yep. when contest prep comes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it it there is benefit in reducing frequency, which mm -hmm. is a volume drop. So the number of sets per session don't necessarily drop, but if we reduce the frequency by adding an extra rest day or something like that, yes. that is a volume drop within itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it can allow for better recovery capacity and the capacity to get cardiovascular activity a little bit easier. Yes. Um, and then also too, on that same note, consistency and schedule relative to work. So yes, of course. if they know like Tuesdays are a day where they're more than likely to get held at work a little bit longer, Tuesday will consistently be a rest day within the week. But yeah. outside of that, like whatever constructs or framework we're running in the all season, most of the time holds true through a prep. Mm -hmm. um, the only time it will maybe change is if just from a time schedule management perspective, it needs to. Um, but I think we can probably run similar constructs outside of specialization cycles. That would be the one place where if we're running a very specialized program within off season where frequencies are extremely high for a certain body part. Yes. Yes. 
we're probably pulling out a little bit of the specialization coming into prep and going to a little bit more of a general split setup. Yeah, which makes complete sense. At the end of the day, Comprem's about sort of tissue retention, right? We're not looking to build yeah. tissue in, into, into a show, which yeah, I think John had put up something about that last week yeah. or so. Yeah it's, yeah, it's always funny when people say, I'm growing into a show. It's like, you, you're not. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in a big energy deficit, you're not growing anything. <laughs> like just, just Unless stop. you're like extremely detrained, it's not happening. Yeah, <laughs> and you wouldn't be going into a comp prep if you're extremely detrained, right? I mean, it's, hopefully not. Uh, well, no. <laughs> um, when it comes to pharmacology and that sort of stuff, so do you... Um, subscribe to a particular model is it anything now that we i think i have a bit more uh, data and information and probably you know better information safer information i guess would probably be the word to use um, okay. not that it's ever really safe but making it as safe as possible um do you prescribe to any sort of uh, pharmaco pharmacological model or is it this sort of go by how you feel <laughs> almost uh -huh. yeah so it definitely <laughs> leans toward what we would call a safer use model um I think I may have my own constructs within the safer use model that may be differential from how it's been originally proposed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also scales within a safer use model. So like risk to safety mm -hmm. um, ratios that will kind of change how the safer use model is ran. Yes. Um, general contextual information is used for, for, for males. Yes. Um, for males, it would be using stack design to manage estradiol. So yes. that would be hopefully not having to use AIs very frequently, um, maybe in short stints or acutely in order to allow for the stack, the changes in stack design to take place. Yes. Um, but other than that, we're not really using it very frequently other than maybe modulating the look at the end of a prep. Yep. Um, sticking with compounds that have clinical data on them. Mm -hmm. So when we look at, and we've, we've done some podcasts on Cuba's, um, on Cuba's show, yeah. the UK muscle about like two round tables going over this, but when we look at like clinical data within some of these compounds. Like, obviously we know that things like EQ, not mm -hmm. clinically approved for humans. Mm -hmm. We see large skewing and CBCs for most people with this. Yes. Um, and it's probably not a compound that, when we look at mechanistically how it works, it's influence on the AR. We have a lot of other compounds that are clinically approved that can do the same thing. Same thing. Yes. Yeah. So um, kind of leaning towards that, even with like nandrolone uses, like there is some data on like nandrolones with like neurotoxicity mm -hmm. um, and, and along those lines. And then that will kind of like limit the nandrolone exposures to the yes. point that for most people, I'm probably not exposing them to a nandrolone for longer than six or six to eight weeks, maybe. Yes. Um, fairly dependent upon the clientele, which then kind of leads us to the point of using more than one pathway to influence yep. hypertrophy, mm -hmm. which is kind of where I fall. Right. There's there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, John and I kind of kind of have very similar beliefs when we talk about prophylactics in the form of Telmasartan, metformin, yep. things along those lines, um, the compounds that we're using within stack design. So test base with DHT derivative progression. Mm -hmm. Um, growth hormone, obviously, to influence growth hormone IGF-1 pathway. Of course. Um, insulin for blood glucose management and some GF, GH through IGF, uh, growth hormone IGF-1 pathway influence as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of like the constructs at which we do and just the amount we use is relative to the client's experience level and milligram needs. Uh, I do not like to discuss compounds from a milligram per kilogram basis. I think there's a lot of... <laughs> Yep. errors with the milligram per kilogram model that yes. we need to kind of take into consideration. It's funny. I, I share the same opinion. So that's fair. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think that like having a conversation of like, yeah, for most of my clients, I'm escalating from X milligram per kilogram to X milligram per kilogram is, is fair because there's so many variations within that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also contextual to like actual body weight and a couple other things, but um yeah, so that's kind of like the the model that I subscribe to is is finding a safer way to be able to modulate our progress at the same rate through multiple pathways yep. um, and making sure that we're utilizing the right compounds to do that. Um, yep. Do you um, have, I guess, time frames that you like to use or have these models in place for, whether it be through a growth phase, like an off-season phase or even a comp prep? Um, mm. Or, yeah, so I find a, a lot of coaches tend to have a, you know, a 
prescribed time. So it's like, you know, we're going to do no longer than 12 weeks or we're going to do no longer than 15 weeks, 16 weeks. Um, do you have a similar model or time frame in mind or is it you seem to just go by the response, like the weekly response and sort of end it, it when it needs to It's very response-based, right? And, and even with myself, but I think that doesn't get us anywhere. So maybe some like objective numbers thrown out of like typicals I'll, I see would yep. be useful here. Uh, but just as an example, like for me, like 800 or 850 milligrams, whatever that stack design total was at, would not have been my peak dose. But <laughs> life factors, my response to training and food, couple other things just kind of let me know like, Hey, like it, it's time to pull the plug, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not the wheels are starting to spin a little bit. Right. Yep. And so like, I kind of pulled the plug there contextually. One of the benefits to safer use models is the duration of time at peak dose mm-hmm. is obviously drastically reduced. Um, and so we can typically see exposures to super physiological androgens um, be able to manage the health metrics and the markers for a lot longer of a time period. And mm-hmm. so we'll typically see, uh, for super physiological all season pushes, as long as health metrics are moving in the right direction, yep. 18, 20 weeks, not mm-hmm. uncommon, um, 22 occasionally. Um, I think with Kubo, we're doing 24, if I remember correctly off the top mm-hmm. of my head. So kind of gives a construct of a relative time frame. Yes. Um, but obviously it's going to be very dependent upon where health metrics are trending. Right. Of course. Um, one of the things like, and just as a contextual information, like, blood pressure and managing that is probably one of the hardest things when we start to deal with these larger athletes. Yes. Um, we have multiple ways to do that. And so mm-hmm. like actually just my newsletter last week for J3U, which I would mm-hmm. highly suggest you guys sign up mm-hmm. was about choosing blood pressures for medication, the classes yes. that we have yep. um, for this. Um, but that's typically the main issue that we, that we see, right? Cause there's a lot of benefits to letting estradiol ride high, which mm-hmm. is where we typically go with stack designs. Yes. But we can also see elevations in blood pressure with that. Um, and so trying to manage that relative to the stack design plus body weight plus overall body fat accumulation mm-hmm. um, is typically where the road, the runway ends, mm-hmm. that alongside sensitivity to food. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of where I'll cut the line, but relatively somewhere in that 18 to 22 week mark is pretty common. And then for prep, it's not too differential. The only thing I will say that changes is extended contest preps due to multiple shows. Yes, that's fair. So, um, um, yeah, that would be the main caveat to that like time frame. Yep. I, I guess the question that I, I do get asked quite a bit um, is, I guess, what would the dif- not, what would the difference be? Because it's pretty hard to sort of work out the difference. But what if we had, you know, scenario A where your athlete, for example, was to just basically move to closer to peak dose to start with and run that. I think the old mentality was, you know, take it all and take it all for a period of time yeah, versus yeah. versus titrating up. When we look at it from a logical standpoint, we know that if you take more from the start, you're not going to have a longer time frame to use um, and grow. For example, if we use growth phase as the example, however, the tissue accumulation in that time could we equate it to the time, the same tissue we would have, you know, potentially accumulated over a longer period of time with less and titrating up? You know, we do have yeah, the health so, side to look at, but there are those that are like, eh, I don't care about health. <laughs> yeah. So I think when we look at accumulating tissue over time, right, we can only accumulate tissue at a certain rate. Yes. And I think that understanding that leans you towards saying that the accumulation is preferable. Um, now caveats, so shortened all seasons because of a contest season. So yep. like when you're looking at pros, right? Mm-hmm. So pros that are finishing a contest season, turning around, going to compete again relatively soon, mm-hmm. that off season phase is going to be quite a bit shorter than the average individual. Mm-hmm. All that does for us is change the escalations. Yep. So the escalations might be larger in mm-hmm. amount and shorter in duration as far as how long we're running a certain dose, right? Mm -hmm. But I still think that when we look at total cumulative tissue accumulation and keeping a runway for progress, Mm -hmm. we need to be able to look at contextually how far up does a client need to accumulate a dose to. That will set the framework of the rate of progression of the dosing across the time period. Mm -hmm. What time frame do we have to work with within the season? 
Um, and I think that when we look at maximizing progress, it still leans us towards accumulating doses over time. Um, and then it's just the way that we accumulate doses is according to the time frame, the constructs that we have. And so if we use that as our construct or framework to work upon, understanding that tissue can only be laid down at a certain rate, mm-hmm. probably have the opportunity to maximally lay down tissue yeah. at a number of doses as we progress up still points us towards accumulating doses over time. Yep, that's completely fair. That's that's a very similar response. It's just interesting to see, um, I guess, what different coaches would respond to with that because I know that there are those that still wish to take, you know, I guess a higher dose earlier on and then just ride that escalation out. And then they realize it's like, well, I could only do it for 12 weeks. It's like, yeah, because you started at five grams. (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's such a contingent topic right like if you if you aren't in the circle that like i I, we have right um and i think that the question that gets asked is well does this not work and it's not that it doesn't work anything super physiological is going to ask issues it's kind of getting into the nuances of like what can we do in order to make this athlete the best that they can be Mm -hmm. If we ask those questions from all perspectives, so rate of progress, health metrics, um, and overall capacity to progress, um, it it still leans us towards accumulating doses over time. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I think from a logical standpoint, the longer you can grow, the better, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think I think too, like there's value in think of it as a training perspective too, right? Because Progressions over time within a training block can go a long time with movements, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the cycling in and out of movements, um, shout out to Killian Hamilton here. There's a course he teaches. It's called skill acquisition through the prescript kind of uh, group. Great friends of mine, Jordan, Killian, love y'all to death. Um, But basically the concept is just like the levels of learning that we go through, right? And through those levels of learning, um, we can kind of use this to frame how we learn new movement patterns. Yes. Um, and we commonly see like with these new phases, especially like if we're looking at all season pushes that are 12 weeks because of the large jump in PEDs, we'll see the, the rotation of movement patterns happen fairly frequently. And mm-hmm. commonly you'll see that large dose escalation with a new program. Yep. Right. So we get, five weeks into the program and we're really just getting our feet wet with a movement, but you've only got 12 weeks to progress and super physiological. Right. And so I think that it all interplays and it all intertwines, right? Like we need to have runway on all variables. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of where I'm a big proponent and also too looking at deloads, right? Like if we're deloading, it doesn't mean that the deload coming off of it needs to implement new movements or a new program. It just means we need to wash off fatigue and then move it up from there. Yep. Uh, and I think there's some things that you can take from having an understanding of how skills are acquired. So through skill acquisition, how yes. do we acquire the skill to perform a movement um, in order to lay the constructs of programming, even within bodybuilding, right? Because typically yep. the skill acquisition conversation happens within performance settings. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes we can do as bodybuilders is is not look at what uh, some performance people are doing and, and transfer those skill sets. Over, over. Right? Yeah. hundred percent. So I think that's definitely a, a big value to think about when we look at that. Yeah. Um, I guess the leading into that, uh, with, from a programming standpoint, what, how often would you potentially change a program for a client? Cause I know a lot of lifestyle gen pop type clients always wanting, not always, but majority of them are usually wanting some form of change in a program more yeah. often, more often than needed, <laughs> um, you know, to keep for variety's sake, I guess with your lifters and that sort of, oh, sorry, your, your bodybuilders will say, I'm used to using power lifters, so lifters, <laughs> um, your bodybuilders, how often would you change their program? If you've already set up the target, you've set up the goal, you've set up the frequency, you've set up, you know, basically pharma, the pharmacology, you've set up nutrition, everything's ready to go. <laughs> and yeah. the only thing now is that that training paradigm, how often would you change a, a program? So I'm going to go at this from two directions. So the first one would be volume levels. Mm-hmm. So I will still accumulate volume over time. Yes. Um, it's just the amount that I accumulate over time is not quite the same as what we would call 
volume accumulation based programming. Mm -hmm. um, so like if we look at like the U curve of response, mm -hmm. I'm staying kind of in the peak top response area of volume accumulation. I'm not going down to the detrained and yeah, or the super compensation area. Yep. Um, and so that's changing every few weeks as far as volume levels, maybe three to five weeks. We're probably doing something from a volume perspective, mm -hmm. um, obviously within the isolation movements. When we look at like changing actual movements within a program, though, um, I will lean towards changing auxiliary slash isolation patterns first before I'm changing the major compounds. Yes. Um, mainly because one, when we look at mechanical tension as the main stimulus for hypertrophy, mm -hmm. Our major compounds are where we're driving a lot of that. And I don't want to spend as much time as I, I want to spend as least amount of time as I can learning a new skill for yep. a major compound. Yes. Second, secondarily, single joint slash auxiliary movements are often take less skill in order to do them. And so the time in which we see to acquire the skill to perform it at the highest capacity yep. is less. So I will always lean towards changing that. And I may change our isolation patterns every 12, 14, 15 weeks. Um, but for major compounds, man, like run the Moya. <laughs> I started my off season push for post show in July mm -hmm. and I still have some of the same compound movements yeah. from July and it's January 17th. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I'd like to hear because <laughs> I, I am the exact same. And I think um, for those that are listening, probably follow a very similar model uh, and you know if they're coaches yeah. that have clients that are always wanting to, or asking them to change it's kind of like well you don't need to there's no real reason because of exactly what you said skill acquisition only, takes time the only area i will do it a little bit faster is injury profile management so of course. Like for, for me um, my patella tendon is a recurring issue um just based off some pelvic to rib cage function with yeah. like adductor stability anyways um because of that, I will have to sometimes exchange out squat patterns a little bit more frequently than I would like to. Um, Considering you move that, six plates on a pendulum. Yeah, so I think that was <laughs> six and a ten the other day on the Atlantis. I, yeah, uh, that's that's big. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a good set, but it it's frustrating too, right? Because it's squat pattern is such a great opportunity to drive tension through musculature yep. um, and getting runaways cut short from injury profiles is, is frustrating, but from a functional standpoint, I'm probably at the best spot I've ever been. Mm -hmm. So my runaways are getting to the point where they're a lot closer to what I would call a perfect or an ideal paradigm yeah. um, for changing movements out. Um, so I'm just, I'm still having to use a couple of tools to limit my exposure. Mm -hmm. So like my squat patterns rotate week to week. So week one is safety squat bar week yeah. two is pendulum. Mm -hmm. um, which is less than ideal if we talk about it from a skill acquisition viewpoint. But I'm rather trained. Once I get a couple weeks in, the skill acquisition is really low. Yep. Um, as it far would, as like the need for that. Yeah, it doesn't so, take take you long to learn the pattern, basically. Yeah, and so the advantage of lower, the advantage of lower frequency to the same pattern mm -hmm. for injury prevention is more valuable than anything I would lose in the skill acquisition realm. Of course. That makes complete sense. And I imagine your, your safety while it being still, I guess, relatively heavy, isn't your main, your main day, right? For legs, your pendulum squat would be your main. Yeah. And my pen, pendulum squat would be my main day. And with, yeah, yeah. with my physique specifically, like I have a leg day and then I have hamstring touch up on a back day Yeah. Um, because of where my legs are relative to my physique. So um also, too, that's secondarily something that I have an advantage with the program setup is that I don't necessarily need the higher frequency right now due to development across yes. the board. Yeah, of course. That makes sense. Um, I mean, you did make an interesting comment, which uh, um, I agree with, but most people probably won't. Being tension is the primary driver of skeletal tissue. Uh, yeah. Right. Again, I agree. That's why I like to train. I prefer to train with minimal volume, but higher intensity or higher efforts, we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then I guess, how does that go about when it comes to programming for the higher volume type client? Because we know that oh, if we sort of use a logical process being, we need more effort 
to create, mm. to have tension, to create skeletal tissue, right? It's like, you can't just sort of lift a weight for 30 reps and, you know, you're nowhere near failure. <laughs> um, you're yeah. not going to be creating enough stimulus there to adapt to. So luckily for us, hypertrophy is a rather forgiving stimulus. <laughs> um, that it is. We see that large ranges can provide very similar hypertrophy outcomes within mm. data. I think objectively, anecdotally, we can see that too. Yes. So luckily for us, like when it comes to like the higher volume crowd, I can pretty much play with larger volume accumulations within auxiliary patterns, mm -hmm. still allow for the compounds to not be what we would call low volume, but be moderately low mm -hmm. um, and more just get the overall framework of total volume set come with frequency um, and some of those auxiliary patterns. And so that's probably where I still keep mechanical tension as a primary driver with those clients that are higher volume within training. It's mm -hmm. like there is some exposure to that higher threshold compound work, yep. um, especially when we look at higher threshold efforts. Mm -hmm. But I think the, mm, the frequency of exposure to mm -hmm. that is a little bit lower than the clients who would lean a little bit more towards the lower volume, high intensity side. Yeah. That's probably where the main change in the program design comes is like, we take our opportunities, but our opportunities to do that are just a little bit lower because we are taking some of that recovery capacity within the total volume amounts that we're training some of these other patterns in. So um, safety is probably a, a big one to consider here as well, especially Definitely. with bodybuilders who functionally are probably the worst individuals <laughs> ever. Yeah. Um, very expanded rib cages for most of us, like as far as like anterior open pump handle, bucket handle, yep. um, functionally shoulder girdle, hip girdles are terrible. Yep. So <laughs> I look at it from a framework of the big three, as far as filling cups up. So you have three cups and you have like your pressing patterns overall as, mm -hmm. as one cup, um, your hinging patterns is another cup and then mm -hmm. your squat patterns as a third cup. Right. Yep. You can't have all three cups filled at the same time. So yes. if I have someone who needs a good bit of upper body development, especially through shoulders and chest, mm -hmm. um, if shoulders is a priority over that chest as well, you're going to be filling up a cup a lot more, having to expose them to higher incline, higher plane pressing yes. because it takes more function in order to do that. So if you're going to fill that cup up more because you're, pressing in what I would call the higher exposure ranges. So basically just like your inclines to verticals, you're spending more time in, yep. um, you're going to have to pull that from somewhere else. Right. And then we go to the other two cups and we would look at it and where we can, we pull that. Mm -hmm. And so this would come in choosing the squat pattern you do. So yep. I'm not going to jam someone under a barbell back squat because of the external rotation that's required just to get under a bar. Yes. That's going to yep. take away from my capacity to press overhead. Right. Yes. So, Again, and then just how much we have to skew the cups tells you how much you have to pull from the other cups. Yes. Um, what I find is a construct that works the most is two cups are prioritized. One cup is majorly deprioritized. Yep. So in that situation, a lot of times what you'll see is a lot of exposure to higher incline pressing. Um, if it's a shoulder specific need, um, if it's chest specific, obviously just for overall directional fiber direction, mm -hmm. a large majority of that pressing is going to be within the flat to mid incline range, mm -hmm. um, depending on rib cage structure. Yes. But then yes. I'm filling up the rest of the cup with either the hinge or the squat based on physique needs. Yep. So, and, and that just kind of where, and then I, I may even leave one cup out. So commonly if like quads and shoulders is one, the squat cup and the shoulder cup will be filled up very well and there'll yes. be no, hinge, no hinge in the program at all. Yep. Fair. That makes complete sense. Yeah. So, and that's kind of the balance you got to strike. Right. And mm -hmm. um, maybe having an understanding of functionally how we work as humans is, is, is a great thing, a great place to start because we can look across the patterns and see where the limitations are going to be as far as like exposure to fatigue over time. Yeah. Um, and I, I to steal a quote from Jordan and for those who don't know Jordan from who I'm referring to is Jordan shallow yeah. from prescript um, is if you're going to coach with someone who's coaching a human body, you might want to coach with someone who knows the human body. body. Yep. 
Yeah, it's a fair right? point. And, yeah. and so uh, I think that that's a very valid point when we talk about programming because bodybuilding a lot of times is not even close to programming. So yeah, that I can, it's a sentiment I can agree with. <laughs> oh. um, so to finish up, my friend, just don't want to keep you too long. We've been going on for about an hour now. So I usually finish up with a question um, that seems to stump a lot of people, which I, I get very surprised by. It's just simply three Instagram accounts that you follow that better your day-to-day life, whether they're educational, whether they're funny. You know, <laughs> What is it that when you're mindlessly scrolling at some point that you get a break from your busy, busy day? <laughs> mm. <laughs> that, that makes you, you laugh. It. Make, yep, beautiful. Obviously, a uh, mentor, one of the brightest minds in the industry, in my opinion. I don't think that there is someone who can process information at the rate that he processes it alongside the fact that he competes at the highest level, yes. top four Olympian, all this other stuff. So John Drew would definitely be one of them. Um, for those of you who don't follow Jordan, Jordan Shallow is probably right along the same constructs of one of the brightest minds in the industry that I've ever followed. Um, I will tell you, Jordan does provide value through his Instagram account, but Mm -hmm. where the majority of Jordan's value is, is within his courses. Um, Yeah. And so actually Jordan Shallow is the person I'll be doing the seminar in the UK with March Mm -hmm. 26th, 27th. So if you guys are in the area, like make sure you come check it out. But Jordan's definitely one to follow. Um, He will change the way you think about programming the first day you talk to him yeah. um so highly recommend that um and then ooh, the third one that's a hard one <laughs> i don't want to leave any of my boys out um <laughs> god don't do this to me um <laughs> mm, I'm, I'm gonna name a couple okay so uh i just did a podcast with aj morris aj is probably uh one of the most popular natural bodybuilders that people would know he's out of the yes. uk um, the dude just gets it. Um, he is a hardcore d- down to earth individual who just gets what the big rocks of moving a physique in the right direction means. Um, yeah. And I think that alongside AJ Kuba would be a good follow alongside that as well. They both mm-hmm. train out of Ultraflex um, in Rotherham. Mm-hmm. Um, great two accounts to follow um, and would highly, highly suggest those. And then my good friend Gloff, uh, Nick Gloff is Nick definitely Gloff another is person. Very smart to give a, give a follow when it comes to programming and stuff. So yeah. uh, those would be, I guess, the top four instead of a top three. Uh, for everyone that I left off the list, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell my boys um, and make sure that you guys uh, look out for, um, and I'm just going to say their names, Callum Raystrick and Ross Byrne. Yep, uh, really follow. good friends of mine. Yep. Um, probably provide a lot of value. They're going through quite a bit of change right now. I'll let yep. them kind of, talk about that on their own accord but probably looking at a second seminar with them in the uk as well so you'll stay tuned for that yeah muscle mentors Um, that'd be fun yeah so i would i would definitely say that and man there's just so many i could of course i'm just gonna stop myself there but that's all right um, man like don't don't stress (laughs) you follow those accounts you'll see all the other ones that we we hang out with and and that kind of stuff so uh, yeah, man, this has been a great podcast. I really appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you putting the time aside to jump on, my friend. And for those that are listening, where can they find you? Where's the best way to find you? Yeah, so uh, Instagram, No Switch Fitness. YouTube, No Switch Fitness um, would be probably my main two where the most content is flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, I have two podcasts. So we have the J3 University podcast. Yes. It's on John's page plus J3 University on iTunes. Mm-hmm. I have my own podcast with the No Switch Fitness podcast where we do quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as like a few different episodes with my different coaches on there as well. Yep. Um, so podcast, Instagram, and YouTube are probably my three main platforms all going to be under No Switch Fitness pretty easy to find so make sure you guys check it out perfect thank you for jumping on good sir and i'm sure we'll uh, have you on again soon maybe for a round table with some of the other boys (laughs) and see what we can talk talk some crap and as always thank you for the listeners for tuning in um we will come back at you very soon with a new episode so thank you for jumping on Mm -hmm.